Welcome. I'm Catherine Fisk, a professor at Berkeley Law, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our webinar on reforming policing through reforming labor relations. We now are going to have a keynote address from Judge Felton Henderson. But before I introduce Judge Henderson, I want to just remind those of you in the webinar that if you want CLE credit, the link to it is in the chat. Those of you watching the live stream can email Pamela Erickson, Pamela Erickson at berkeley.edu to get signed up for MCLE credit. It's a great pleasure to be a colleague of Judge Henderson and to introduce him. Felton Henderson graduated from Berkeley Law School in 1962. Judge Henderson was the first black attorney in the Civil Rights Division of the United States Department of Justice. He protected voter rights alongside everyday citizens and visionaries like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In 1980, President Carter appointed Judge Henderson to the federal bench where he's transformed, where he's championed transformative justice for many decades. During his career on the federal bench, he was involved in civil rights enforcement against the Oakland Police Department. He has tremendous experience in this area. Since retiring from the bench, he has been a distinguished visitor at Berkeley Law School. Judge Henderson. Good afternoon, and, and thank you for that introduction, Catherine. I'm honored to be giving this keynote address today and uh, to be a part of this uh, very distinguished group of scholars, experts, practitioners, and on the ground arbitrators that have put together this great program. It's my hope that by sharing with you some of my judicial experiences and my observations, it will be helpful and maybe even a bit interesting, who knows, as today we take a fresh look at police unions and police bargaining and labor relations law in general. And we explore whether their present structure contributes to the many problems and concerns we have about police misconduct, accountability, and transparency. I'm giving this keynote address from the perspective of one who over the course of 37 years as a federal district court judge has handled a number of rather high profile cases in which police officers, police departments, and city governments have been sued for various acts of police misconduct. My plan for today is to review one case in particular. And although that case did not specifically involve labor relations or police working conditions or collective bargaining, it's yet my hope that it will nonetheless give us additional insights into the enormous challenges we face when we try to bring about any kind of change, meaningful change or reform to our police departments. Now in the year 2000, I was assigned the case of Delphine Ray versus City of Oakland. It was a case which profoundly changed the way that I came to see, to view police departments, the way they operate, the way in which they relate to the governmental entities for whom they work, and the way they treat, relate to the people in the communities in which they serve. In the Allen lawsuit, plaintiffs alleged multiple acts of mistreatment and misbehavior at the hands of certain Oakland police officers who were known as the riders and in fact, the case came to be known as the Riders case. The 119 class members in the suit variously alleged that they had been kidnapped, that evidence had been planted either on their person or in their homes or both, that their front doors had been kicked in and their homes and persons searched without benefit of a search warrant or even a warning knock on the door and that they had been beaten by the police, despite the fact that they had posed no threat of any kind to the arresting officers. 
The class members further alleged that the Oakland Police Department and the city of Oakland had either encouraged or turned a blind eye to these alleged abuses, all of which, not surprisingly, took place primarily in East Oakland and West Oakland, that is, in the city's predominantly black and brown communities. Fairly, on, fairly early on in the proceedings, the parties informed me that the prospects for reaching a settlement looked quite promising, and they asked me not to push them too quickly toward a trial. I readily agreed to this and essentially took a hands-off approach to the case as they assiduously began settlement negotiations in this most difficult and highly controversial case. Eventually, after months of discussions and negotiations and numerous case management conferences in open court and several urgent requests for seeking guidance from the court, the parties no negotiated the largest legal settlement in Oakland municipal history. And on March, 20, March 14th, 2003, the court approved the negotiated settlement agreement or NSA that had been reached. In addition to calling for the city to pay $10.9 million to the class members, the NSA included a list of 31 reforms to be made by the department. The reforms ranged from the upgrading of the department's outdated technology and equipment to requiring each officer to wear a cam recorder while on duty, to improving their training program for both incoming and old officers. It was also agreed that they would change their practices regarding racial profiling and adopt new policies and practices regarding use of force. Now at this point, it's very important for us to note that not a single one of these 31 reforms was new or untested or even innovative for that matter. Indeed, the reforms were essentially a list of best practices that were being implemented throughout the country by virtually all of the larger and more modern police departments. I'll apologize in advance because you're going to hear me reiterate this point because it's central to one of the main points I hope to make. As soon as the NSA was signed, an independent monitoring team was put in place to ensure that the police fully understood what they were to do and to provide appropriate training and guidance whenever it's needed, as well as to ensure that the department was in fact complying with the NSA in a timely and in a sustainable manner. Now, before I go on, I think I'd like to just take a quick aside and note that it was such a light this morning, earlier today and just recently, for me to listen to our first panel, which included Professor Christy Lopez, who was a key member of that first monitoring team on the Riders case and who did a superb job of monitoring in that case. And I remain indebted to you and that team, Christy. You got us off to as good a start as we could have. Continuing with my uh, comments, over the 21 year history, year history of the Riders case, the Oakland Police Department has had 11 chiefs or roughly a new chief every two years. It is my considered opinion, notwithstanding some limited successes in a few of the 31 NSA tasks, that all of these chiefs have failed to implement sustainable change because they have been too heavily influenced or perhaps the correct word is controlled by the power of the internal culture of the force as well as by the apparent weaknesses, or perhaps the correct word is the indifference of the city leaders, both appointed and elected. And of course, by the power, or perhaps by the agenda of the union itself, which without, with the exception of the most recent leader, uh, has over the years heavily embraced the retention of the status quo. For me, one of the more interesting, revealing, and frustrating aspects of this case is that some 13 or 14 years ago, 
one of the 11 police chiefs asked if I would schedule a case management conference, which I agreed to do. This was after the new chief had been around long enough to familiarize himself with the task at hand, to become acquainted with the union leadership and personnel, and to receive a full briefing from the monitoring team as to exactly what remained to be accomplished under the NSA and the best way to go about ending the case. And at that case management conference, the chief stated that he had asked for this meeting in order to assure me, the judge, that the writer's case can and would be closed within one to one and a half years. Now remember, this announcement was made about 13 to 14 years ago, and I have since retired, and the case has been assigned to another judge, and they're still very much ongoing. And at this point, the end is not yet in sight. What has utterly fascinated me over the life of this case is that it has left me firmly convinced that this chief, with the best of intentions, believed what he told me and I'm further convinced that he was correct, that the case could have, and indeed should have, been closed within the time that he indicated. In fact, I'll go on to say that it should have already been closed before he had even come on the job. But when that announcement was made in my court, on the record, my immediate thought was that maybe now, finally, we have a chief who is willing and able to take this bull by the horns and do what it takes to end this case. Unfortunately, not. As I've said, when the NSA was entered into, it was clearly contemplated by the parties and by the court that all 31 tasks would be completed within a two year period or so. And again, I remind you that these were not 31 highly contested, intrusive tasks that had been thrust upon them by some vengeful federal judge after a long and difficult trial. Remember that each and every one of these 31 tasks had been agreed upon by both sides and only after months of careful negotiations and conferences and with guidance and participation of the court. At one point in the case, things were proceeding so slowly and so poorly that the plaintiff's attorneys asked for permission to file a motion to place the department under receivership. Now this is an extraordinary request and especially so for a police department and especially for a police department the size of Oakland's. I have had only two such requests for receiverships in my 37 years on the bench. Most of my former colleagues on the court have never experienced such a request, let alone granted one. My law clerk was able to find only one instance of a police department being placed under receivership, and that one was by agreement of the parties at the, with the mayor of the small town playing a major role in the negotiations and the police department was much, much smaller than the one in Oakland. But plaintiff's attorneys were also well aware of the fact that I had previously placed under receivership California's entire prison system, 33 prisons in all, the largest prison system in this country and the fifth largest in the world. And that decision was eventually upheld by the US Supreme Court. So plaintiffs were hopeful that I might be able to do the same thing in this case. But police departments are considerably different from prisons in many, many ways. The most important in my mind being the public safety aspects of the policeman's job. And the second most important being the simple fact that prisoners are not unionized. So instead of inviting the motion, I advised the parties to meet and confer and try to resolve the matter. They eventually came back with a solution. I would appoint someone who would be called a compliance officer. 
but who would have some of the powers of a receiver, but without the title. It turned out to be quite helpful later on because among other things, it gave the compliance director the power to fire the police chief. So just what happened along the way? What were the months of settlement talks all about? Was there a misunderstanding? Were they held in bad faith? And why, for heaven's sake, would a city's leadership do little or nothing while literally millions of dollars of taxpayer money is being spent each and every year on a civic cancer that is not only curable, but should have been removed many years before? Based on my 17 years of experience on this one case, here are some suggestions regarding this enigma. One, over the years, I've been consistently informed by the two monitoring teams that worked on this case that the police department sternly resists cooperating with them in their efforts to retrain the officers in ways that are designed to change their behavior, to change the ways in which they interact with the public and change the preconceived racial attitudes many of them bring with them to the job. In many instances, instead of embracing this training, the department seems more concerned with placing check marks on a form and thereby avoiding any engagement with the spirit behind the requirement. They refuse to actually address the behavior that is the subject matter of the particular task. One example is when they're asked to deal with racial profiling. Instead of explaining why the particular stop was made as is contemplated, they insist on being allowed to simply check a box that indicates the race of the person they have stopped with no further explanation being required. Or if they are required to consider evidence as part of a review on use of force, they insist upon being allowed to simply say that they considered the evidence, despite the fact that the monitor's reviews consistently show that they do not give the evidence sufficient weight or that they came to an unreasonable conclusion with respect to that evidence. Two, when one of the 11 chiefs that I previously mentioned came aboard, one of the first things he decided to do was to have a mass meeting with the entire police force. By this time, the city had negotiated a new contract with a different monitoring team because the defendants had bitterly complained that the original team was too hard on them and too demanding. I made a point to have someone from this new monitoring team attend that initial meeting and report back to me what was said and done. The report confirmed my very worst fears. I was told that the chief began the meeting by discussing the negotiated settlement agreement, saying that he felt that it was a funky thing, that's a quote, a funky thing that led to frivolous and nitpicky complaints being made to the internal affairs department. The chief repeatedly said that he would be playing the game with the court and with the monitors, biding time while he sought to end court supervision within the year. I immediately wrote a letter to the chief and, uh, and had it hand delivered. In that letter, I told the chief that he was off to a very bad start and wasn't likely to last very long on the job with that attitude. He immediately responded, asking to meet with me, and I agreed to do so the very next day. And as an aside, I should mention, uh, I should make it clear that I had the permission of counsel for all the parties in the case to hold this ex-party meeting with the chief. Long story short, the chief now in full contrition mode explained that he felt that he had to say those things to the troops. It was the only way he felt he could comfortably fit in and be accepted by members of the department and especially 
by the leaders of the Oakland Police Officers Association, the union that represents Oakland's rank and file. My takeaway from this meeting was that, was that it is the new chief who must fit in and adapt his own or her own values to those of the force he is supposedly taking over rather than vice versa. Three, when new recruits come in and they begin their training classes, on the first day, they are told something like this by their trainers. Now I know I'm supposed to teach you some stuff that the court has ordered us to teach you. And I'll do that, but it's important for you to understand that this is not how things are really done around here. You'll learn that later on when you start working on the job. Now this is a prime example of what I call undermining, which is defined as the action or process of lessening the effectiveness, power or ability of someone or something, especially gradually or insidiously. And throughout these many years, this has been my experience with this case. The undermining began, in my opinion, from the very outside, outset. I have concluded that the NSA was entered into with the clear expectation by the defendants that they would be allowed to go through the motions of making meaningful changes to the way they conducted their business. This is the way they were expecting this thing to go. And in fairness, this is the way many of these uh, kinds of cases go. Uh, they, that they would, as the, it was their expectation that, as the chief said, play that funky game with the court and after a couple of years of half-hearted and token efforts, checking boxes rather than changing behavior, the monitors would finally say, well, I guess that's good enough. The court would routinely sign off on it and the case would be closed. At which point they would expect to resume business as usual. No meaningful changes made, no lessons learned. Four, the police department seems by my observation to have been allowed to flourish almost autonomously. It seems not to have been accountable to anyone except perhaps the court under the NSA. The city's leaders, both political and appointed as I met with them repeatedly over these many years, have appeared to be largely indifferent or perhaps powerless, or perhaps a better word is helpless to affect any real change. While perhaps seeking NSA compliance, they seemed much more motivated by their determination to outlast or outweigh the court. And in that way, purging the city of the court's oversight, instead of encouraging and guiding the department through the agreed upon 31 reforms and changing the role of the department so that it becomes a guardian of the constitution in both word and in deed. Five, the department's internal discipline system is deeply flawed and perhaps, and appears to be designed more to prevent the disclosure and correction of disciplinary problems than to uncover and correct them. When this was brought to my attention, I immediately appointed an investigator to look into the internal discipline system of the department. Three separate reports were prepared by my investigator the first and second reports found that the department lacked clear policies and rules against which officers could be judged, that internal investigations failed to consider all relevant facts and witnesses, 
that police investigators did not adequately consider the possible uh, responsibility of supervisors and that the city attorney's office lacked meaningful participation in the discipline process, all of which seriously undermined the disciplinary process. In particular, the two reports found that the city attorney's office failed to do its part to uphold discipline by often selecting to represent the city's interests outside counsel who were completely inexperienced in matters of police discipline. The office also failed to adequately prepare for arbitrations and failed to litigate as aggressively and effectively as possible. The investigation further found that neither the police nor the city attorney had a system which could identify problems that were learned through the disciplinary process and thereby make required and necessary improvements. I had once imagined that the Oakland Police Department would complete its long multi-year reform efforts well before it was time for me to retire. Near the end of my career, things actually began to improve to the extent that I began to say to myself, to my law clerks, my staff, and others involved in the case that I could finally see the light at the end of the tunnel. The most recent police chief had been hired from inside the department and had impressed the monitors very much by his insistence on holding officers fully accountable when as a member of the internal affairs department, he would receive a complaint he insisted upon accountability. He was an outlier in that regard. He looked like just the independent-minded chief we had been looking for, and things began to improve. But alas, somewhat akin to a Shakespearean tragedy, these hopes were dashed after a sex abuse scandal involving an exploded, uh, exploited teenage girl. I first learned about the scandal in March of 2016 through the monitor. A suicide note left by one of the police officers had implicated certain of his fellow officers in ha having sex with a young victim of sex trafficking. Eventually, the department disciplined 12 officers firing four of them. Prosecutors filed criminal charges against three officers and a recently retired sergeant. The chief's failure to disclose the scandal to the monitor and the compliance director, as he was required to do, led to his personal undoing. And the third report filed by the investigator, it was found that without the court's intervention, likely no officers would have been held accountable in this scandal. The department had botched nearly every aspect of the investigation, including hiding the case from the district attorney's office and allowing the victim to destroy evidence during a police interview. The report further found that the department's criminal and administrative investigations throughout the entire incident were uh, completely inadequate. Investigators did not follow up on leads and further, their reports did not accurately reflect interviews, did not appropriately involve the city attorney's office and on those occasions when they did involved the city attorney's office, they ignored that advice. And finally, that the department leadership did not adequately supervise its investigators. Now, these are but a few 
of the experiences and insights that time allows me to share with you today. For me, it is crystal clear that the balance of power that should normally be an inherent part of the bargaining relationship itself is just not present when it comes to collective bargaining for police. The public interest is ill-served by the present system. And in fact, the public interest seems to be little more than an afterthought. The bargaining system should, of course, serve the legitimate interests of the police, but as well should serve the interests of the public for whom they work. The many years that I and teams of talented, experienced monitors have tried to train, coax, push, cajole the Oakland Police Department to comply with their own agreement have convinced me that the OPD, the Oakland Police Department, as is the case with many other police departments around the country, simply does not want to change the way it does business. The present system is working perfectly well for them, even as it works against the interests of the public. They especially do not want to be told how to do their admittedly dangerous job by a federal judge who knows little or nothing about the day-to-day -day hazards and complexities that police officers face. As, this, as an historical matter, our police have been guardians of the peace, guardians of our communities, who patrolled our streets to keep them safe and who knew the members of their communities. But beginning with the so-called war on crime in the 1960s, it seems that they have evolved into something more akin to all soldiers or an occupying force with battle armor and with tanks and assault weapons ready to do battle with the communities they have vowed to protect and serve. And with the political clout that they have incrementally amassed over the years through the union bargaining process, it will take significant changes to make a difference given the deeply embedded, deeply divided society that we presently live in. And until we start this process, such as we are discussing here today, I have no doubt that many will continue to treat court orders and NSAs like funky things that do no more than lead to nitpicky and frivolous complaints being made to the Internal Affairs Department. And they will continue playing the game of compliance, playing it with the court, with those who govern the cities that they work for, and with the citizenry whom they have sworn to protect and serve. Now, when I began preparing this keynote address, it was my intent to share with you only my long and frustrating experience in the writer's case. That was my initial intent. But for someone tasked with preparing a keynote address for an upcoming webinar on police reform, I could not have had a more fortuitous phone call than the one I received on the morning of last December 26th, the day after Christmas. The call came at about 11.30 a.m. as I was in the midst of my second cup of morning tea. Sorry to bother you like this, Thelton, but the 17-year-old son of some friends of ours was killed last night by two Antioch police officers. It's absolutely heartbreaking because I've known this young man since he was two years old. He was not resisting. He wasn't being violent. And in fact, his mother was holding him in her arms when the police arrived. He had no weapon and he wasn't a big guy. He's just about 140 pounds. He has some mental problems. And as he sometimes does, he was having an episode during which he was threatening family members 
and the family called the police for assistance. To my utter amazement, my, my friend explained, uh, the police had taken the young man from his mother's arms, placed him on the floor, and placed his neck on the young man's, placed his knee on the young man's neck. When do we ever learn? My friend confirmed that they got everything on video. My friend went on to explain that even as he was talking to me that morning, more police had come to the house and they were going through the entire house. They eventually conducted a seven to eight hour search of the house, looking for who knows what. And the family became worried that they were going to plant something in the house. After, the fin after they finished the search, leaving the house in a shambles, they demanded a copy of the iPhone video that the family had been taking. My friend asked if I knew how to contact an attorney who was a, a certain attorney who was the best known and most successful attorney in this area who specialized in police misconduct, excessive force litigation. And by coincidence, it was the same attorney who had filed the Riders case. And since this was the day after Christmas, my friend knew that the office would be closed. So I agreed to call the attorney whom I had come to know over the years, explaining what, I had, what had just happened, what I had been told. And I asked for his permission to give his personal phone number to my friend, which he granted. And thus began yet another case against yet another police officer in yet another city where yet another person of color, this particular young man was Filipino, whose family trusted the police enough to call for help and their loved one ended up dead. Like all the others, it will almost certainly end with a lawsuit being filed against the officer or officers and the city of Antioch. A trial or settlement will follow. There will be almost certainly some sort of payout to the family born entirely by the city, not by the police department or the union or the officers. The taxpayers will pay with no punishment to the police officers involved or little punishment. And if there is some punishment imposed, a right to an arbitration system that is more than 50% likely to set aside or reduce the punishment. And then we begin our short wait for the next such incident. All of us here today are faced with a Herculean task, one which at the bottom is primarily structural and systemic. And I note that our previous speakers have recognized that too. And we all know that changing the failings and shortcomings that I've been discussing will not come about with a single stroke of the pen. But we do have the ability to begin the process of making changes to our labor relations law that will contribute to the transformation of policing. And we can begin by taking a close look at the reasons why there seems to be so very little accountability in these cases and where by any fair or reasonable measure, the line of appropriate behavior has been crossed. We can look at the disciplinary protections that policemen have successfully negotiated for themselves and which are defended by saying that police work is dangerous, which it obviously is, and that the present rules help ensure that chiefs don't impose discipline because of political pressure or personal biases. Public outcry, it is said, can unfairly influence a city's decision to fire an officer accused of excessive force. On the other hand, 
Many city leaders argue that the protections operate as handcuffs on their ability to impose change and that the community unnecessarily suffers as a result. I am strongly convinced that changing the present labor relations structure of policing in the ways that will be discussed by today's speaker and was discussed this morning in the first panel will go a long way towards reducing and controlling police violence and misconduct, lack of accountability and lack of transparency. We know something is wrong when a new chief comes in and not only is unable to affect change that he or she envisions, but is compelled to march to the beat of the union and police force he or she should be leading. We know something is wrong when a city and police department enter into a negotiated settlement agreement and over the course of 20 years and with near impunity refuses to do that to which is it agreed at a cost of millions and millions of taxpayer dollars. We know something is wrong when one side in the bargaining process eventually amasses such an imbalance of power that it seems to operate as an autonomous unit, almost independent of its employer. As Harvard Law School professor Benjamin Sachs has stated, when unions use the power of collective bargaining for ends that we as a democratic society deem unacceptable, it becomes our responsibility, including the responsibility of the labor movement itself to deny unions the ability to use collective bargaining for these purposes. And I fully agree with Professor Sachs. As I said, we are faced with a Herculean task. And so was Thurgood Marshall when he set out to challenge the deeply embedded Jim Crow and segregation laws in our Southern states. By some measures, he started in 1947 and he ended seven years later in 1954 with Brown versus Board of Education a case which changed the law of the land with respect to segregation in our public schools. Changing our views on what things can be the subject of collective bargaining and finding acceptable ways to take into account the impact of these agreements upon the public, which is after all the ultimate consumer of these services is of the utmost importance. As the governor of Massachusetts recently said in announcing that he had just signed new legislation creating a police accountability and oversight system for the state of Massachusetts. And I quote, police officers have enormously difficult jobs and we are grateful that they put their lives on the line every time they go to work. Thanks to final negotiations on this bill, police officers will have a system they can trust and our communities will be safer for it. It will take time, but now is the time to begin the process. Thank you very much, Judge Henderson, for those remarks. Thank you, Kathy. Quoting one of the comments in the Q&A, grief, anger, but I would add hope are all that are getting us through under circumstances like those you describe. On the subject of hope, I now want to turn to our second keynote speaker, California State Senator Nancy Skinner who represents California's ninth Senate district. She's my Senator. Um, this various cities in the East San Francisco Bay area, a social justice advocate, an energy and climate change trailblazer, an accomplished legislator who served three terms in the California State Assembly. 
Senator Skinner has been an advocate for legal reforms to reduce mass incarceration and police reform. And she's graciously agreed to speak with us today about some of the initiatives that she and the California legislature are working on to address the terrible problems that Judge Henderson identified. Senator Skinner, thank you so much. You're welcome. And uh, Judge Henderson, thank you for your good remarks. And I would have loved to have listened to all of them, but the, uh, the legislature requires a two hour sexual harassment training. And uh, I, was, um, I had to be involved in that and I could not depart it to listen to all of your remarks. But I certainly look forward to hearing from you any, um, I will look at this uh, legislation that you just mentioned of Massachusetts to see what uh, new, new aspects that it may bring forward that maybe California should consider and very much would uh, welcome any suggestions from you as to other things that we in the legislature do to address this issue of creating um, good police accountability because good police accountability improves public safety. Without it, we do not have good public safety. We need to have trust the, the communities that our law enforcement officials serve need to trust those law enforcement officials or those law enforcement officials cannot do their jobs adequately. And right now we know that, especially in communities of color, there is a great deal of trust lacking and it's legitimately lacking because of the amount of brutality, harassment and others that, uh, that black Americans and other Americans of color experience all the time. And that I will be completely honest with you. And I think everyone who really, is, you don't need to just look at the data that is now being collected. My colleague, Dr. Shirley Weber, Assembly Member Weber, who is now our Secretary of State, required, got a bill passed, which the governor signed into law, which requires now all of our police agencies to collect their data on the racial profiling of their stops. And so, Whatever anyone may have wondered, we now, we now have it in concrete and hard terms. The differential between being stopped as a white driver and being stopped as a black driver or a driver of color. And I certainly experienced this in my own life where uh, I, anyone who um, knows me and uh, observes when I drive to the Capitol, I... I uh, I drive within the, uh, I, I would say how other people are driving, but it is not the speed limit. I have only been pulled over once and just by myself. The only other times I have ever been pulled over as a driver, and I've been a driver for many, 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 many years, was back in the late 70s when I was driving a then candidate Gus Newport around the city of Berkeley as he was running for mayor and I got stopped three times and I had never been stopped prior to that. And of course he ex helped explain to me because I was so naive. I had no idea why I'm all of a sudden am I being stopped so often. Then I was never stopped again until I was driving a colleague of mine, a uh, Latinx colleague of mine. And so uh, it's, uh, and my driving, my personal uh, way of driving is not different. And the vehicles I used were not different. Anyway, so now let's get into some of the things that the legislature is doing. I mentioned Dr. Shirley Weber's bill. Um, the, uh, now back to accountability. California in a very badly, and uh, Governor Brown admits it was a huge mistake. It was something that he uh, in effect did. Um, over 40 years ago, California enacted a law in the hopes that police departments would save their records. So what California was experiencing prior to this time is that police departments were basically destroying all their records of any complaints or any um, investigations of their, you know, looking into their own officer's behavior. The records were being destroyed so that they would not be available, for example, in court cases or publicly available under our Public Records Act. And so Governor Brown, in an effort to try to preserve those records, in effect, uh, made a law or 
signed into law, a law that would prevent any public access to any police records. But at the same time, the police had to retain those records for a minimum of five years. So here we were denying any public access. However, the department would have some records, but that would only really be available in a court case or under a subpoena. So we had a situation where California was an outlier amongst all states. And literally, when you look at our Public Records Act, almost every other public employee, we can find out and you can request and get information or records on any aspect of their job performance. Not so law enforcement. Now, this um, when I first got into the legislature, there were a number of attempts to try to fix this law. Uh, Senator Gloria Romero had attempted, Senator Mark Leno, and each bill that came before I supported never passed. These bills never passed. So um, two years ago, as a senator, I began to talk with various uh, advocacy groups who wanted to change this law for some time, and we decided to try again. And we narrowed our attempt at that time, meaning we narrowed the set of records that we would allow. Now, I'm going to put this in a context. This was before, um, which you saw last year, Governor Cuomo basically signed into law, a law that in New York state allows every sort of police record, but New York state, like California prior to that, had not allowed it. So in the context that I was carrying my law, no other state had recently done any other action to create some sunshine or transparency around their police records. While most other states did have access, much better than California, none had acted on it. So there was no real headline around this. Anyway, I was very fortunate to have the Newspaper Association fully behind me. And the benefit of that is that at each, um, at each uh, hearing and such like that, that I presented my bill, you would have every newspaper doing an editorial. And at each time when there was a vote, the uh, various newspapers would report on which members, how they voted and point out who did not. So that was helpful. Um, I also had other good partners. Now, what that bill did, when I said before it's narrow, what that bill did was create the possibility for the public to access records about police use of deadly force. So that means when they drew a gun and actually shot it. So they had to actually shoot the gun. Um, secondarily, uh, police um, dishonesty, but in a narrow way, that dishonesty, which involved um, interfering with the witness or tampering with evidence. And then additionally, the bill allowed for us to get records on the uh, proven sexual assault of an officer while they were on the job. So not sexual harassment, but rather assault. And uh, that I'm sure many people think, well, well, how could that have not been publicly accessible? And how could there even be officers who had proven sexual assault? But actually there were for whom had no then no consequence to that action. Anyway, so that bill that was SB 1421. Fortunately, it was successful. It was very difficult. It only um, succeeded by one vote, but Governor Brown signed it into law and those records are now available. And most of the agencies have complied. However, there are some outliers. For example, there was an article in the paper today about the fact that uh, San Diego, I'm not sure which department, has not responded and has not released any records yet, even though now we have, we're going into more than a year and a half or more than a year that this um, law has been in effect. Now, as I mentioned, these were a very narrow set of categories. This did not give us information on an officer who had repeated incidents of discriminatory behavior or bias. This did not give us information about officers who um, had a pattern of unlawful arrests or searches, um, a whole variety of other things, which if we think about accountability are, are really needed for the public to feel that they trust the officers. The other thing that we found is that the way my bill was constructed, and this again wasn't intentional, is that once the bill came into effect, if you were an officer who might be, who was about to become under investigation, you could quit the job and go off to another agency and there would be no record then on that activity. And so you would have nothing to, you know, that would trail you. And the next agency that hired you would not know that this uh, circumstance um, had occurred. So this new bill that I've just introduced 
which is, um, and apologies, I don't always remember my bill numbers. Maybe somebody could look it up. I think it's SB 76. Um, that bill, what it does is it would create a circumstance where we would get access to uh, these records, records around an officer's, um, a broader use of force. So drawing, even drawing the weapon, not just shooting it and other forms of excessive force. Additionally, um, an officer's uh, incidents of bias and discriminatory behavior, officers with a pattern of unlawful arrests or searches. And additionally, the bill would create a paper trail so that even if an investigation wasn't completed, if an officer quit, then that uh, when they moved on or tried to move on to another agency, that record would follow them. Additionally, the bill requires that a, a, a hiring agency must request the full set of records that are publicly available <clears throat> about that officer so they know exactly who they're hiring. Because very commonly we hear after an incident and we learn later that that officer had a history, we learn that the agency said, well, they had no idea. They did not know this. So my bill would prevent those things. Now the bill I'm referring to, la I had introduced it last year. It was successful on the assembly floor. I got 53 or 54 votes. So it was doing great. Um, however, there was just some hangups on the last day of session and it didn't get to my house, the Senate on time. So it never got to the governor's desk. So it is the identical bill. So I'm pretty confident that it will pass and it will be a great advance in terms of our ability to get some accountability and some transparency around police activity. Now, is this enough to create the type of accountability that I think all of us would want? No, but it is a step. Now, let me tell you about a couple of the other bills that are right now um, coming forward in the legislature. My colleague, Senator Bradford, has a bill that would allow California to decertify an officer that has already been, uh, has done certain types of misconduct. And there are many, many other states where once you have, once you are an officer who have, who has engaged in certain types of misconduct, you can be decertified. California, again, is an outlier here where we do not allow that. And Senator Bradford is put that forward. Interestingly, my police records bill, which in the past, the police officers unions always opposed, they are neutral on it at the moment. The bill they want to kill is Senator Bradford. So they are very opposed to his. Now we have uh, another bill, and I don't know who the author is right now, that would require uh, our law enforcement officers to have a minimum of two years of higher education, meaning community college or other type of certi certification program. They could not just be a high school graduate. And because right now, most of our agencies only require GED. Then my colleague, assembly member Ash Kalra has a bill that would require um, agencies to look at the background of officers so that if there is the evidence that an officer is engaged in uh, an active participant in these uh, extreme, these extremist, far-right extremist movements, as we saw in the uh, insurrection at the Capitol, where we learned later that a number of the participants who were active in either QAnon or the thing called Three or these various other um, Proud Boys, that some of them were actual uh, law enforcement officials who are in active, not active duty in the insurrection, but ha are, are hired by forces right now. So um, my colleague, um, assembly member Cholera has a bill in that subject area. So those are some of the legislative initiatives that will come before the legislature this year. But I think I'll stop at this moment and allow for some questions because I'm sure you all have some and I'm sure you will have uh, rather than my continuing to, to assume what you might wanna know, your questions will allow me to answer and give you information. Oh, thank you uh, for my bill number SB16. My, yeah, 776 was what it was last year. Thank you so much. I, yes, I have a lot of bill numbers. And so I remember their content, less their numbers. <laughs> Thank you so much, Senator Skinner. Um, this is very interesting. Um, 
One of the questions in the Q&A is, given the change in the political environment, why not simply eliminate PC 832.7, Penal Code, I think, 832.7, and make all police disciplinary records public as they are in many other states? It's a good question. And part of it is what is out. It's... Um, it's always the back and forth when you're a legislator as to uh, what are the conditions, the political conditions that can give possibility of success. Now, that does not mean that I only carry bills that I know are going to pass. For example, I authored the, um, uh, the bill that eliminated or re changed the concept of felony murder under the law. Oh, there was no guarantee whatsoever that that bill would pass. There are many bills that I've carried that are what I might call high risk, uh, high bar. Um, the issue around the police records is that, and I think Judge Henderson described, our police unions in this state are very, very organized and very active. And the other interesting thing is um, my Senate caucus, we, we, periodically have um, different entities that do polls present to us. And we just saw a recent poll of Californians. This was done um, in uh, early January after the insurrection, interestingly. And Californians very, very highly rated that they were in support of Black Lives Matter. But they were in almost equal level of support, or actually I think it might have been higher, of police officers. So there's a I don't want to call it a disconnect. I'm more call it that that uh, as much as the public wants accountability and reform, they also respect their officers and they do not like the defund the police that as a concept pulled very, very badly. Whereas use um, nine one use officers, use nine one one dispatch. Uh, send social service people to mental health calls versus officers, you know, use officers only for crime calls, not for, you know, social welfare type of calls, high, high, high polling, but which of course means diverting resources. But if you ask it as defund police, bad. So it's, it's that um, the, the, we, te I shouldn't say we tested, but we, we have neutrality by the police unions right now for this more records. So it is an advance, it isn't everything, but it opens a door again, if we're successful with this, to do more. And I know that may not be a completely satisfactory answer, but it is the, the types of things we juggle when we try to construct legislation. Thank you. Well, while I wait to see if people attending the webinar have more questions in the last 10 minutes where we have your time, I wonder if you um, would care to comment on what you think of either the wisdom or the political prospects of some of the proposal, proposals that Judge Henderson and others, including me, have made, such as, for example, greater mandating by law greater public access to police negotiations before, for example, a contract is made available for negotiation, um, state mandate transparency of all contract proposals, um, as well as greater transparency of records of disciplinary actions, whether it's civil service appeals or um, arbitrations under a collective bargaining agreement. Right. All right. So right, um, right before I give an answer to all the points that you made, I see in the Q&A the, the notion of supporting transparency is not opposing police officers. I agree. Here's, the, here's where the rub. So if we say, if we say uh, all disciplinary, it's not just disciplinary records, it's because many, uh, 
you can open a disciplinary because there was a complaint and then you find that it wasn't substantiated. And what the officers, what they communicate, again, not taking sides, just expressing, is that, well, then this information comes out and I'm, it's the old, uh, I'm guilty, I'm, I've been proven innocent, but I'm assumed guilty because the complaint was made. And the whole issue of my own safety and, you know, given that there is, you know, that law enforcement officers do take their lives in their hands every day and that they themselves are also subject to, uh, to uh, you know, certain members of the public wanting to do violence against them. So there's that. And they, and I bring it up because the officers themselves and the officers unions are able to use, and they construct the argument much better than I do in terms of their, the way they communicate it to get either the public or other legislators to, to feel like, oh no, that's not fair to you. So that's why I want to raise it. Now, in the, um, the questions that uh, Catherine and, uh, just raised and the proposals that, um, like for example, to make all, to make much more public um, access to and transparency to all parts of the contract negotiations. This is where you get into some very sensitive labor things. And while, while I completely appreciate that law enforcement is very different than say our, um, our librarians or our street sweepers, for example. However, labor as a whole would, would, this is one of these things where there would be the argument that if you were gonna do it to one category of workers, you'd have to do it to all. And if there was not support to do it to all, then they would ban band together. So, and I will just give you the example of my first records bill. In the previous attempts, Senator Leno, Senator Romero's, all of labor, not just the police unions, but all of labor opposed those bills. So it, it took a long time to get labor to the place of seeing, wait a minute, why are you opposing a bill that would give access to police union to police records that you all your members, all your SEIU and AFSME, et cetera, all other public employees, their records are available this way. So it was a lot of work to get them to uh, to get to the place where they would not, in effect, join up with the police unions in being opposed to the bill. So there, it's a it's partly a, an issue of just how labor as a whole deals with it, and um, uh, uh, and then the officers' own sort of example of that. That's why they are a union to give themselves the ability to, uh, you know, collectively bargain and if we look at other um, collective bar circumstances, that sort of information is not made public. Right. That is a great um, observation. One of the questioners, as you can see, but I'm going to read it out because others can't, uh, asks a question aimed at uh, sort of creating countervailing power, I would say. Lots of people think of police unions as being disproportionately powerful in the legislative process because of their force as lobbyists. And the question asks whether or how you involve community groups um, in developing or supporting legislation people who are impacted by police brutality and incarceration. And so how you think about trying to balance the power that police unions have. Right. Well, there certainly I carry some bills that my staff and I are the originators of, but many of my bills are brought to me by the very parties that are being described, such as ACLU or the Ella Baker Center, or all of us are, and none, or um, the Oscar Grant Foundation, for example, or um, multiple other organizations up and down the state that are uh, Boys and Men of Color, Policy Link. So all of the entities I just mentioned are very strong partners with myself and my office on many of the bills that we have done, including the last police records bill and the current police records bill. Um, now, 
I see various things about times have changed. And yes, times have changed, which is why my first police records bill got through. And it's why the second one will get through and why hopefully we'll even be able to get Mr. Bradford's decertifying of officers. However, let's look at, there's two factors here. One, every union that is large, every large, Every large public employee union in this state has great political clout because of the campaign donations that they give and other reasons. Um, so in that respect, the police are not that much different. Now, but we add to that where the public still has a great sympathy towards police. As much as there is great awareness of Black Lives Matter and support, the as I mentioned in these polls, there's a... There are many, many people can hold both thoughts, or I don't mean hold both thoughts. I'm not trying to describe it as it, but just are like, absolutely, Black Lives Matter. Absolutely, stop police brutality. However, I love my officers. Don't do anything to hurt my officers. So this is a one of these competing things that then the police know how to utilize, and not just the police, but you know, who, whatever entity that doesn't want legislation that they don't love, they use these types of sentiments to their advantage. Now, all important reform bills, whether it's for consumer protection, privacy, police accountability, or any number of things that have a very difficult time getting through the legislature would be greatly, greatly aided if we had public money and we did not have to rely on campaign donations. Greatly aided. And so I think there are many people have talked about this. One of the most important reforms to get a whole host of reforms that all of us would want is to, is to eliminate uh, this kind of private spending in campaigns and use public money. Though with the various Supreme Court rulings, that's hard, but it is a very important thing to look at. There are so many other questions that I would love to have you answer, but we you agreed to give us 30 minutes out of your busy day and our 30 minutes has elapsed. So I thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. And I look forward to seeing what else you and the legislature are able to do in this area. Um, I wanted to let people know that we are now going to take a 30 minute break. Um, that is until 1.45 Pacific time. And the audience can log off if you choose or you can stay on, but you would use the same link to rejoin when we resume at 1.45 with the first of two substantive panel discussions on transparency and accountability. See you in 30 minutes.